This message is brought to you by danmolerarchive.com, the number one place to search over 2,500 Dan Moeller messages in growing. Now, please enjoy this message. Man, I had a good morning. I was sitting back there. We, we, I barely made it out here, Todd and Will and I. We were talking and I started sharing some things. We were all crying and they're like, can we just pray? And we're back there and you guys are out here crying. And I'm like, what is going on? So, Shoo, I feel mushy. I uh, was sitting on the couch when they came in, and I was like, I, I'm just so loved right now. I'm just in good. And Todd, he had peace. I said, man, you got peace on your face. He said, oh, dude, it was just fun. But I was wired last night. I, I don't know how to say this. Jesus blessed me. You guys blessed me. Because when hearts are open and receiving and ears are hearing and people are hungry, it's the best thing. You know, I, I tell people, people say, man, that was awesome, or that message was so simple or clear but profound. I say, man, it's one thing if I'm preaching clear to me. I, it's one thing if you think I'm preaching clear. It's another thing from my shoes, if you're hungry for it, you want it and let it become truth in your life. See, that's a payday for a guy like me. That's like, yay. And Because uh, that's why we do what we do, right? Because we believe what we believe. So what you hear in the secret, you shout it from the rooftop. So I got back to my room last night. I was so wired. I was just, I was wired. And I don't sleep that much, man. I'm like, I just don't. <laughs> people, people say, do you drink coffee? I said, could you picture that if I drink coffee? <laughs> I said, I don't think I ever drank a cup of coffee in my life, honestly. It was never in my home. And the, the generation I grew up in, it was kind of... It was kind of presented as an older person drink, like kids don't touch it. And now teenagers are like drinking coffee at a very young age. And I, I never, I don't think I drank a cup of coffee in my life. Uh, but, and it's not that I'm against it or anything like that. It just never was in my life. But last night I was so wired, I think I went to sleep about 1.30. And I didn't even know if I was going to go to sleep. And I had to go to sleep by faith, you know. You just like... <laughs> I just turned off the light finally. I had a little dim light. I had some worship going. I was talking to Jesus, talked to my wife for a little while. And then I, just, I told her I was going to go to bed. And then I was like. <laughs> and I said, Lord, this ain't working, is it? It's just us anyway. So, so it didn't matter if I got mushy and went through Kleenexes because I didn't have to preach. So at 1.30, I finally just turned out the light. And I was like, oh, Lord, I'm going. And I went out. And then at 4.47, I'm like. I say, good morning. <laughs> and that's it. It's over. It's like, it's, see, I'm messed up right now. It's just over. <laughs> good morning. morning. See, when I first got saved, I would close my bedroom door on purpose. Contact point of faith. I did it for me. Theologically, he's always in me. Theologically, he'll never leave me or forsake me. Agree? but I want to go meet with him in the secret. So I would close my bedroom door on purpose. Never close my bedroom door. It's always open. But I would close it on purpose when I got saved so that I had to open it to go in. I would slip in, close it, and say, hey, it's me. Exactly what I do. About four days into that, my heart caught an awareness and a knowing of him being there waiting for me. It wasn't that it was a vibrating, whoa kind of time. It was, a, it was a knowing thing. It was a, and then it, it even became very tangible to me. Don't talk about that much because everybody's looking for the tangible to believe. I believe through his word. He said, if I'm there, he'll be there. So he's there. What don't feel real, not talking about feelings. What don't seem like he's there, not talking about what it seems. If he said he's there, he's there. When are you going to teach yourself and when am I going to teach myself to just believe the word? When I live apart from what it seems. A lot of people say, well, I do that. It just feels like I'm going through the motions. There you go again. It just feels. Stay there long enough and teach your heart a knowing. Teach your heart a knowing. If, if, if you don't hang out with each other, you'd never get to know each other. People aren't married because they just walk up to each other and say, hey, man, I dig you. I mean, I guess it happens in Vegas, but it probably falls apart in a day or two. <laughs> but if you're sitting here married, you have a history with your spouse. You hung out. You went out together. You spent time. You grew to know each other. 
at some level, you communicated. And got, I wasn't real good at that with my wife. I didn't, I didn't even, she didn't even know I didn't want children when we got married. We just got married. But we hung out for nine months, talked, and, and we got to the point where we got married. What I'm saying is if you don't be with him and spend time with him, how will you ever get to truly know him? Listening to a sermon teaches you about him. Getting alone with him is knowing him. If you just learn about him and get a whole bunch of knowledge of him without getting intimate with him, the knowledge will turn on you in time and you'll buy into condemnation because you'll judge your life based on what you know and your life won't look like what it should based on what you know. But it's not knowing about him that transforms you, it's knowing him. He said if you love, we said it yesterday, if you love... It's because you've been born of God and you know God. If you don't love, it's because you don't know God. That means, watch, that means you can't know him without being so influenced by him that you're transformed and changed to be more like him. What he's saying is if you don't love, it's because you don't know God. That means you can't know him without becoming love. He's so amazing. (laughs) The goal, I said it all week, Weekend, and, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's kind of midweek, isn't it? Late week. I, I said it the whole time. You can't, you can't miss this. You, you can't just receive the love of God. The goal is becoming the love of God. That's the goal of the gospel. Why? Because when Adam was created, he was created for God's image and likeness, and God is love. The day he ate the tree is when everything died and was lost. So watch this. So Adam was one with God, walking in the cool of the day, like father, like son. He's fulfilled. He doesn't have need. He doesn't have lack. The only thing he's missing is an avenue to manifest and multiply the love. That's why God made man. Because God is who he is, he makes man, gives him a body to flesh out who he made him to be. Let's stop just believing our flesh has to always be evil. Let's live in conversion. Our flesh was evil because our hearts were evil. We got new hearts. Yeah? (laughs) You know how I've prayed for years? I thank you, Father. I live in a spirit. I have a soul and a body. My spirit rules. My soul agrees, and my flesh says, yes, sir. I've prayed that way a thousand times when you weren't looking. Rather than, well, you know, the flesh is weak, brother. Jesus makes one comment outside of prayer. Watch and pray, because your spirit's willing. Your flesh is weak. He's talking about outside of prayer. And then we say, flesh is weak, brother. And it's our justification for living weak. Well, you're not to live in the flesh. You live by the Spirit. And if you live by the Spirit, Galatians 5, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yay. Come on, it's so scriptural. So Adam is love. He he made man in his image, so he made man to love, not to need love. He made man to love because he's fulfilled in love. He's one with God. He's the source of love. He's he's one with God. Right? Vine, branch. Yeah? When that branch got cut off from the vine through sin, he got cut off from the source of love and became in need of love because he lost his identity in God. Every one of us sitting here was born into that dilemma. We were all born into Adam needing love. And the truth is we were all created to be love, not need love. Because to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, is to be filled with all the fullness of God. Colossians 2, you're complete in him who's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You are complete in him. Be real with me. We've tried to find ourselves through one another and have been sorely disappointed. Why? We're looking for love in all the wrong places because we're so driven by the need of love. That's why the words, I love you, work no matter what the circumstances. They usually work. 
Because we all want to believe that we're loved and we all need to be loved. And we all need to believe we're lovable. And it's a blight and a dilemma that came through separation from God. It wasn't from the beginning. The biggest lie in Christianity is to assess ourselves by ourselves and think this is who we are. When he said that's everything that's supposed to die. It's never who you were from the beginning. Like God didn't make us this way, guys. We became this way through Adam and sin. We were born into Adam and we must get born. And we turned that into a beneficial prayer that takes me to heaven when I die. Instead of a truth that restores me back to the beginning and what God intended in the first place where it's full of grace. Are you with me? Born again, the motive of born again is not a prayer to go to heaven someday. It's getting restored back to the reason we're here in the first place and all things renewed. Yeah? To where I'm not in need of love because I've been loved and now I become love. Are you with me? Our whole lives were driven by the need of love. That's why most of us got hurt at a very young age. That's why people do so many terrible things to each other because it's every man for himself at the cost of whoever. Love lays down its life for another. We grew up living at the expense of one another and people living at our expense. Total perversion, 180 degree twist. Yeah? Love lays down its life. Takes no account, no account. Doesn't consider the wrong that's been done to it. Why do we all have a story of how wrong we've been and how they did this and I can't believe it and never again. I ain't gonna, nobody's ever gonna do that again and whoop, 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 whoop. Now you got walls all around you and you become a product of men's sin instead of his righteousness. And you think you're winning because you cut them off and they're actually deciding your person in the moment. That you wouldn't even be this person if it wasn't for them. <laughs> you cut a person off and don't talk to them for two years and think you're winning because you cut them out of your life? No, they're dictating your heart every day. They're sculpting you. They're etching you. You're actually a living product of what you can't forgive. <laughs> you're, you're the direct result of the thing you think you're cutting off. <laughs> See, unforgiveness is wretched because it keeps offense alive. But forgiveness is amazing because it makes it as if it never happened. That's what's so beautiful about the gospel. It's the design of heaven that the goodness of God would lead men to change. That even in your life, in times, you say, well, I'm not going to enable people. They ain't going to turn me into no doormat. Was Jesus a doormat? Or was he the living epistle of love? Is he an enabler? Is he a pacifist? Or is he amazing? Yeah. I hung out with him this morning. He was pretty amazing. (laughs) I was nervous coming out here. I thought I was going to be a mess. I feel all right. (laughs) You say, you don't look all right. This is the best I can give you right now. (laughs) I'm trying to stay a little okay. He's real. He's amazing. And he has purpose, right? Let's make sure it's not just a beneficial purpose for our sake, see? He made me for a reason on the earth. When I come into agreement with that reason, I'm going to walk in a full measure of grace. He's not going to fill your tank to drive down roads he didn't create you for. That's why life feels dry for people. That's why they believe life is so hard. It's the view they're living from. Everybody on the earth, Peter said, don't you be deceived. Everybody in the world is going through the same trials and challenges you are. But we tend to make it all about us, my go through, need prayer, need counsel, need ministry, help God. And all our prayers are driven by what we believe we need instead of motivated by what we're pursuing to become. I'm going to make some strong statements right now because they're in my heart. Not one of you have to treat me right for me to be okay. If I woke up to need you, I'm at your mercy. If I woke up to love you, we're okay. You get it? Come on. 
Now, you be honest. How many times do we wake up with unspoken expectations, subconscious expectations? Just because of the level of relationship, there's expectations. And it's automatically, I do for you, you do for me. Well, you shouldn't have did that. Well, that really hurt when you said that. Well, why weren't you there? Well, I thought you could be on time. How come you're always late when it's important? Well, I just don't feel like you value me. Well, I just, well, yo, no, but it's not. Oh, uh, 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 uh. You know what that's a sign of? Not being smart or facetious or cynical. That's a sign that we don't know him like we sing. Because when we live that way towards him, he doesn't get that way. If God ever assumed the attitude we've put on each other, we'd have no hope. If God said, well, that really hurt. Well, I know you knew better. Why did you do it? Now your heart's in question, and I don't even know if I can trust you anymore. wonder if you came to the altar and God met you here and spoke like that to you. You'd be pretty overwhelmed and hopeless and freaked out. Well, he made us for his image. And if I put that in the mouth of God and it sounds foolish because we know him through his word, it ought to sound foolish in our mouth because we're made for his image. And as he is, so are we in this world. And as the Father sent him, so he sent us. So if I can't find it in him, I don't want it in me. So here's the whole point of this morning and the whole goal. To walk in this power and love thing and never get trapped in works and let it become your identity, you have to have intimacy with God. You get alone with him. You be with him. He unveiled your face through the blood. If you have one reason why you can't be with him, it's deception. You say, but you don't know what I just did. I, I get what you're trying to say. So why are you running from him and playing Adam in the garden? Why aren't you running to him, New Covenant, New Testament? Why aren't you running to him in your conviction, separating your heart from the action, separating your identity from the action, calling the action what it is, stepping out of it into him, thanking him for making you wiser and sharper and keeping you righteous and clean through the blood. And I'll promise you, if you'll do that, that action, you'll be way more aware of it and it won't sneak up on you and you won't stumble into it. Why? Because you're separating yourself from it through faith and prayer and you become... That thing you're believing because you're saved by grace through. So when you release faith in the truth, grace comes to make truth your reality. And you didn't even bite your lip to change. So he gets all the glory. And then you love him more. And you might get like me. No, I don't want to scare you with that. Don't anybody run away because you think you'll get like me. That's, that you just be like you. <laughs> People have said, what's wrong with you? I'm in love. I'm in love. You know how crazy people get when they're in love? They're eating off each other's plates and licking off each other's spoons. <laughs> I'm in love. <laughs> I'm sorry. I could get in trouble here soon. <laughs> I've been up since 447 in love. <laughs> Right now, I'm so pregnant. It's, <laughs> I've been with the Lord. <laughs> You've been up to something, brother. You're sticking out. I am, man. I'm about to bear down and push. <laughs> that thing that comes out is going to look just like its father, I promise. <laughs> I'm pregnant. <laughs> you ought to be pregnant. <laughs> Listen, I've learned this. I've learned this. Two people start getting intimate together, somebody's getting pregnant. Or else they're trying real hard not to. Make sure you're not trying real hard not to. Make sure you don't just want touched by the Lord. Spiritual contraceptives. I want to be touched by the Lord. I just don't want to sell out. I want to be ministered to by the Lord. I just don't want to give him all. That's spiritual contraceptives. <laughs> Probably all. What are we doing right now? <laughs> I 
We're not looking for an experience in him. We want to bear fruit unto his name. And in this the Father is well pleased. That you bear. And you know them by their. And if you bear much fruit, he'll prune you so you bear. Wow. Be fruitful and we hear, ooh, Adam and Eve going to get it on and have some kids. The whole, con- the whole concept and the whole motive of Scripture is his image. What he's saying is, be in me, be in me. Each seed after its own kind. Come together in me, two, one, reproduce in me, and everything that comes forth is in my image, cover the earth with my glory. Be fruitful and multiply. He's talking about his image. Cover the earth with his glory. He's not talking about just go have a whole pile of kids. Multiply who I created you to be till the whole earth is filled with my glory. They're in a garden place. They're tending and keeping it. Be fruitful and multiply. You can't live in a one-room apartment that long. You can't start having children What's going to happen in the garden? It's going to spread out. They're going to tend it and work it. And it's going to spread out. It's God's garden of delight and paradise. Paradise. Who's man? God's crowning creation and glory. The expression of who he is. The manifestation of God. That's who man is on the earth. Let's just get over that. That's not heresy. The manifestation of God. In the new covenant, reborn man filled with God's spirit is the manifestation of God. The Christ in you is the hope of glory. Glory means any made known, realized manifestation of the attribute of God is the glory of God revealed. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of God being seen and known. (laughs) Be fruitful and multiply. Cover the earth with his glory. So what happens? They start having children and they spread out in the garden. The psalmist says, what is man? What is man that thou art mindful of him? Look, I don't get it. What is up with man? Why do you dig him? Why do you keep your eyes on him? Why is your gaze upon him? Why do you show him favor? Why do you give him extra chances? Like, what's up with man that you're mindful of him, that you'd visit him, that you would give him dominion over the works of his hands? The psalmist is saying, what is man? Angels look and wonder. I imagine the devil's thinking, what is it about this man? He's jealous. We got redemption. He's lost forever. We can walk in God's image. He threw it all away. That's what Todd was talking about yesterday. His whole goal is to deceive the people made in the similitude of God and make them look just like him. That's his whole goal. The whole war is each seed after his own kind. That's why you know them by their fruits. That's why you know a man and and what's on the inside by what he's bearing witness of on the outside. Even his words give away his heart. Out of the abundance of the, the mouth speaks. You said it for the third time and you say, oh, I was just playing. No, you weren't. It's in your heart. And we learn to live on the surface. We learn to live shallow. I know we do because one of the, one of the biggest comments I get, which is not flattery to me, it breaks my heart actually, they say, what I like about you, you're so real. And I'm like, what are we? What's everybody else? What are you? Half and half, hypocrite. Somewhat in, putting on a jacket, come on. The biggest testimony shouldn't be because, man, I like you because you're real. (laughs) You be real too. And if other preachers aren't real, don't let that make you not real. Don't you let where their heart isn't decide where your heart is. Let your heart be found in him. See, that thing happened to me a long time ago. I got invited to a pastor's meeting, and I was only safe for two years, but I already was a full-time pastor. But I'm green to them. I'm young in the Lord. I already moved in all the gifts of the Spirit. I had seen miracles. A lot of the pastors didn't even believe in healing, didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I woke up the day I got saved praying in tongues. So you got a hard time talking to me about it. (sighs) 
I'm innocent. I'm naive. I go to the pastor's meeting. I think it's going to be the most spiritual experience in my life. I'm like, man, I get to go in here with 80 pastors. Newspapers were there, writing articles, unity meetings, county pastors coming together for unity. It was the biggest farce and the biggest tragedy I ever experienced since and before. It was all about who's who. It was about the paper, publicity. It was so clicky you couldn't get close to people and everybody had each other stereotyped for their well they came from. I went week after week, my heart grieved, and I was in trouble. I was letting my heart get offended. I was letting my heart get hurt by men. I was getting justified because I was right. When you're right, that makes people wrong. You're outside the kingdom. That's not righteousness. Righteousness makes wrong things right. Righteousness looks at those men with hope and a future and a destiny and praise from their potential, not their blight. Jesus didn't come right. If he came right, we're wrong. He doesn't rule his kingdom with the scepter of right. It's righteousness. It makes wrong right. Man. But I started realizing Holy Spirit wasn't in the prayer meetings. I started realizing it's who's who. I I, I, I took a little personal because I cry out my heart. I'm in a place of intercession anyway. I'm leading intercession. Every day I'm interceding for hours for my city and for the body of Christ. Hours I'm in intercession. And I go to a prayer meeting. My heart is raging in prayer. Do you understand? And then I, I, I whisper in, Father, I thank you. And before long, I'm crying. And I got things in my heart and vision. And now I'm praying. And everybody's freaked out. And all the leaders are, are saying, you need to Put your pastor on a leash. He's an emotionalist. He's trying to get everybody emotional. And, he, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, the world's dying, and people don't understand, and Jesus is Lord, and he shed his blood. And, ah! and I'm like, right? I'm like, I'm probably like, ah! And they were overwhelmed, and I decided, okay, so I just won't pray. I'll go. I just won't pray. So then I said, I'm not even going. And my pastor said, no, you need to go. Just keep going, have faith, keep going. I don't have faith. I said, I don't have faith. I'm wasting my time. I'm, I don't want to go. And I kept going anyway because he said, please go. So I went, and, and this guy starts praying. And I lifted my head, and I thought, Jesus, you're here. <laughs> no, I'm not being mean. I, I, I was like, oh, my goodness, you're inspiring that. That's amazing. Lord, and there was a glimmer of like, oh my goodness, you're in the prayer meeting. And then I didn't even know the guy, and he's praying, and you could just tell the Lord was in it. And the leader, the one, there's four leaders, the leader said, right in the middle of his prayer, okay, okay, cut it off, cut it off, it's eight o'clock, if we don't stop now, Larry will never get through the front nine. And I went, just what I heard you do, but it was a dangerous place for me. I went, Oh, and I'm expressive, and I'm not a closet, closed door kind of guy. I just rolled off my chair and cried on the floor. I'm not saying I should have, but I did. And 80 guys walked by me like I'm a kook. Three or four men rubbed my shoulder and patted me while I was bawling. I get in my pastor's car in the back seat. He has a visiting pastor with him, and I'm in the back seat. (gasps) The whole way to church, wailing. That wasn't the Lord. It wasn't Holy Spirit grieved. He is bigger than that. See, I've had to pastor intercessors because I've led intercession for years, and intercessors can get funny with this thing. They, they, They leave the service and cry all afternoon. Your Sunday service, they cry, intercessors, they cry all afternoon, and then on Tuesday you see them, and they're still almost crying, and you say, what's going on? Oh, Holy Spirit is just still so grieved because pastor cut the worship off a little too soon, and I'm like, Holy Spirit hasn't even cried at all about that. You cried about that because you've been praying about our worship, and you have interest and and desire, and it's all emotional. You're, you're grieving for three days, and you're, you're spiritualizing. Holy Spirit's way bigger than pastor cutting the worship off five minutes early. He's not crying for 48 hours. 
That's you. Stop it. I've just been around it a lot. I was caught up in it. I'm in the back of the Jeep. (gasps) Pastor's driving with his little, with his guest pastor, his little friend. And I'm, we pull up to the church. I get out. He says, are you all right? I'm not exaggerating. And I was heading to a room. There's a place I would always go when it was intense. I'd go to the nursery. It was prophetic for me just to go be like a baby, a child. I'd take the most serious marriage counselings to the nursery, and I'd put them on the little rockers. (laughs) I would. If the marriage counseling was intense and I'd sit down in my office, I'd say, guys, let's just go to another room. I'd take them right in the nursery. They're like, why are we coming in here? Because in a minute, you're going to be like little kids, or we ain't even going to have an appointment. (laughs) You know how I talk in counseling when the door's closed and people won't repent? I'll say, well, if you won't repent and you won't look at each other and cooperate, then we might as well stop because I can't even help you. You're both bound in yourselves and selfish, and I'm going to ask you if you're even born again. That's how I counsel. Where do you say you've surrendered to Jesus and you hold such a right to have a right against your own spouse to where I can't even counsel you because you're so busy in rightness and wrongness that I can't even reach you, but yet you called the appointment? Are you born again? Pastor, we've been coming to your church for three years. Coming to our church for years doesn't make you born again. Christ-likeness is born again. I don't see him at all. That's how I pastor. So you might not want to call an appointment with me. I'm gentle. I'll smile. Sometimes. <laughs> I've had occasions where I've asked the lady to please kindly step out of the office and close the door behind her, and the guy's sitting there going. And then I tell him, I don't, I'm not here to control you. You owe me nothing. But I challenge you to man up and be a man of God and listen to me for about five minutes. But if you want to leave, I'd suggest you leave now. No, I'm good. I'm good. <sighs> Countless young men sit there and cry their eyes out. I honestly don't have one memory of anybody cursing me, yelling and slamming the door and walking out of my office. Why? I don't have a need to correct anybody. I love people and I hate to see them deceive themselves when they can live so much more. So I'm bold enough to tell you the truth for your sake and heaven will go with me because he knows my motive. I have no need to be right in your life. I just want to see you do well. And when I know you're crashing, you better believe I'm desperately crying out. You know what most of us do? Clam up and stop communicating. Because we're intimidated and we don't want to and they're already offended and we don't know they're deceived and they're spiraling and somebody needs to intervene and say, hey! Hey! So I'm a pastor, I have that authority usually, that position, and it's almost expected, so I really get away with it. But here's why I get away with it, because of love. You you say it for them. Are you with me? You say it for their sake. I went in the nursery, I'm back to my pastor's story. And that awesome Holy Spirit will take you right back where you were. You can't do that on your own. I've been talking too long and I told two other stories. So you just. What we're back at the nursery. I lay on the floor and I cry for 30 to 40 minutes. I'm sobbing on the floor. I'm being spiritual. And I'm building a case against the pastors in my mind. And as I'm crying, I'm remembering all the things I've experienced week after week in the meeting, and I have a serious indictment, and I'm a prosecuting attorney in prayer. I sit up on my knees and put on my intercession voice. Father, I lift these men before your throne. That's what I did. Father, I lift these men before your throne. And he goes, shh. And I went, and cried and fell back down on the floor. 
Because <gasps> I really got shushed by the Lord. And I cried hard for a few minutes, not long, a few minutes. And in my heart, I said, why did you do that to me? He said, Dan, you were only going to pray for them then because you've located what's wrong with them. Well, first thing he said is, Dan, what you're seeing in them men has nothing to do with you. You keep your eyes on me and go after what I've called you to. And I cried hard at that because that was stern correction. And then this is what he said to me as a father. Dan, you've been looking at them men and you've located what's wrong with them and you were only going to pray from the place of what you see wrong with those men. If I let you pray from that place, it won't be very long. Something's very wrong with you. And I lost it. And I cried and I said, what would I be if you didn't father me? I would be sure I was right and I'd be so right I was wrong. Might even take the time to build a ministry on being right and attract everybody else that's right. And we'll just have a rightness party. What would we do if he didn't father us? Guys, if you're not in communion with him, if I'm not in communion with him, how can we expect him to intervene? How would we ever hear that kind of correction? How would I ever be at my bed crying out to go to the mission field and Holy Spirit reveal that it's my frustration towards the church I'm pastoring that's birthing the motive to go to the mission field? It's not the Lord. It's discouragement having children. If you're not communing with him and talking to him on a daily basis like that and being one with him and thanking him that he loves you, not hoping that he loves you, he already proved he did. Thanking him he loves you. Thanks for being a father unto me. Holy Spirit, I receive you in my life and I'm open for your wisdom. Thank you, you only speak what you hear and you don't even speak on your own authority. You are the will of God revealed in my life and you'll reveal Jesus and you'll manifest Jesus and you'll bring glory to his name through my life. Holy Spirit, I yield to you. Yeah? It would be amazing. You know, it would be amazing wake up in the morning and sit up on your bed and instead of just yawning and burping or passing gas or whatever we do, <laughs> you, you actually look at your clock and go, wow, six o'clock, that came fast. But you know what, Lord? Your grace is amazing in my life and you've taught me how not to complain and I'm done dreading my work and I'm done thinking it's a grindstone when I see now it's a privilege in a mission field and there's people all around me. I'm going to walk in the light today as you're in the light because you're empowering me. You've got my eyes fixed on you. Father, I used to not appreciate my job. I thank you, God, that I have a place to work. I thank you for my boss. If he knew who he was, he wouldn't be living and acting the way he is. I'm done being mad at him. I have compassion for him. Father, he's lost and doesn't know you, but you're in me and I'm asking somehow you give me influence in his life and shine. Father, I thank you for Billy who I work beside hand in hand. I haven't been the greatest representative for a long time, but things are changing because you're doing a work in me. You are teaching me the truth of why you're in me and man, I'm going to have a great day with Billy. Thank you for your redemption. I am pumped. It don't even feel like six o'clock now. <laughs> yeah? Young people, school age people, college age people. Could you imagine waking up in the morning and sitting on your bed instead of going, oh man, Wednesday, two more days, don't even, have, can't even have the weekend, man, and oh, and I got science today. <laughs> Come on. Wouldn't it be a whole lot better to sit up on your bed and say, Father, I just thank you for my school. 
I thank you for the kids in my school, my peers, my age group, those teachers, God. Would you bless the teachers today with wisdom? Would you guard their hearts from frustration? I know a lot of my peers don't respect and honor and appreciate. God, I think we're missing what the privilege we have. And I'm just asking that there'd be a supernatural favor on our school today, God. And Lord, I thank you for empowering me. And I thank you for giving me insights in anything necessary to reveal your glory. God, I thank you for who you are in me. And I thank you for another day at school. All of a sudden, you get the face of Jenny. And you go, Lord, what about Jenny? And all of a sudden, you see domestic violence and two adults just freaking out. And you see a little girl in a corner crying. Now you go to your locker, you look down from here to that rope, and there's Jenny at her locker, and you hustle down there, and you say, hey, Jenny, how are you? I'm okay. Listen, I feel like there's some serious domestic stuff going on with your parents. You're afraid they're going to split. I feel like you're really worried. You've been crying a lot. How do you know? How do you? Listen, honey. I've been with the Lord. I've been praying. He showed me your family. He showed me you curled up crying. I was sitting in a corner. How can you know? It's okay, honey. It's Jesus. He loves you so much. He's going to walk you through this. We're going to pray for your parents. And most of all, he's going to teach you how to be strong and live in a healthy perspective and not be overcome by this trial. <sighs> Who knows that is way more than possible. And many of us can share testimony after testimony after testimony of those kind of things. Yeah. I worked in a warehouse. Those guys are mean. Most of them are mean. The 11 that came out of the closet and declared they were Christians, I had to get a hold of myself to even believe they went to church. And just understand that they were humble enough to confess they were Christians because my life so affected them. They came out of the closet and said, hey, we've been going to church the whole time. And I'm like, I almost reacted like, what? <laughs> now I'm going to get a forklift and I'm like, hey, Mike, what do you need? Everybody needs something. Everybody, well, Mike, listen, man, I just need a move. You know, it's the job, bud. I'm not pushing you. I'll get around to it, but if you can just sit this skid in the aisle, I need a whole skid. It will help me a lot, man, okay? Yeah, yeah, I'll get to it when I can. That's just a warehouse. It's his job. It's what he's supposed to do, and he gives everybody that asks him something a hard time. So you could learn to resent him, dread him, hate him, or fight back. So guess what? I'm just done with that because Jesus is in me now. Yay. So now I have a different answer and a different view. So I'm like, hey, Mike, it'll be okay, man. We're going to have a great day, okay? Just thanks for the skid. I go like this, and I say, hey, man, you know what I just saw? What do you mean what you just saw? Bam, bam, bam. Grown man, mean, three seconds ago. Woo! On his forklift, bawling in the aisle, unheard of. Warehouse, you don't cry. Men eat your lunch when you cry. I wrapped my arm around him. I said, it's okay. I just saw that. It's the Lord. It's time to look to him, man. You've been so frustrated, but it has nothing to do with your job. It has to do with home, and it can work out. Stop fueling a fire that you've been hoping goes out. You've been putting logs on that thing, man. <sighs> Dramatic. Come here, man. It's okay. I can't believe you. You're not. Jesus is real, dude. What do you think? I just have theology? He lives inside of me. Yeah, I tell so many stories from my workplace because they're fun. Because if you're not careful, if you're not careful, you let things get on your nerves instead of living with new nerves. You slowly let things bother you because you justify the scenario in rightness. And then you miss living in righteousness. And all of a sudden you build a case against somebody that it's living in deficit. Instead of having mercy on them, you're bothered by them. Because you're taking their life personal instead of his life personal. Intimacy with God changes all that. You can't commune with him in the bedroom and, and be in love with him unless you're in a total delusionary place. It just doesn't work this way. See, because this is the truth. Nobody on the planet truly has this and doesn't have this. 
The evidence of this is this. And the evidence of this is this. Nobody on the planet has loving one another without this. Because the whole reason for this is this. You get it? I remember a young guy would come to work. He had purple spiked hair and it was in a mohawk. And he had the sides completely shaved. So, you know, preachers say, that boy's just looking for attention. He's just this and that. And they're so busy trying to diagnose him that they fail to even value him if we're not careful. He runs from me like I have leprosy. He hears me talk about Jesus. He's gone. I wear a Christian t-shirt. He don't even look at me. Like, I can't even get to him. He's on another team. He runs from me like I have a plague. I remember my orientation. They said, go around the room and share a little about yourself, where you're from, and and, and, did it. and the guys, it was unbelievable. They'd be like, they'd stand up, they'd lay the, uh, um, uh, and they'd mumble and barely talk and sit down. They got to me, I'm like, hey guys, my name is Dan, and uh, actually I, I've been pastoring for the last two years, and I just felt like getting back in the workplace, working with my hands. Nothing's wrong with pastoring. Actually, you know, I had good income there. I just gave it up. I felt like I wanted to come here and work. So I'm excited to get to know you guys, meet you guys. Uh, I love the outdoors, but as far as he said, my hobbies, I just love Jesus. He has transformed my life. And they're like, I'm not exaggerating. When we got up to leave the orientation, there's two doors in the cafeteria. They all saw which door I was heading to, and like cattle, they're all going out this other door. Like, it was that extreme. When they called out the names to pick the teams, every time a team got filled and I wasn't on it, they were like, yes, ah. And when I got called on the team, everybody was going, you got the cuckoo. (laughs) On the day I left, the head guy called a floor meeting, honored me and said, if we had a warehouse full of this man, it would be a supervisor's dream come true. We know he's been an asset and a blessing to every one of you, and this is his last day in case you didn't know it, so you could give your regards. But we tried to offer him a part-time position, never in the history of this company have we done part-time, just to keep him here. We offered it to him, but he feels like he has to move on. We're sad that he's going, but we sure enjoyed that he was here. Please give him regards before the end of the day. And they treated me like I had leprosy when I got there. My team said, we feel like we're losing our dad. What are we going to do without you? I said, you're going to live for Jesus, and you're going to run well, and you're going to stop all the nonsense. You're going to manage your money right, too, right? Because I was always on them about money. And they were like, yeah, dad. (laughs) Why? Because it's just not your job. It's your life in Christ. And, And I remember he was sick. The guy with the mohawk was sick. And he had the flu symptoms and he was going to leave. And somebody was moaning on his team up at the desk. And they said, well, he's cutting out because he's sick. We're going to be a man short. Man, we ain't going to get paid nothing, man. We're going to lose big if he goes home. And I'm like, man, I I wish I could talk to him. I just want to pray with him and encourage him. So what happens? I pick an order. I take off. I'm pulling my order. He's got an order. He's getting three here, two here, three here. I'm getting one here, one there, two there. So I'm like, and I'm coming around, and he's up the aisle, and I'm coming. And he's like, he's coming. So he's just, he's just working. And I'm coming, ain't no stopping me now. So I didn't need nothing right there, but I pulled in front of him, and I jumped off, and I said, hey, man, listen, I know we're on the clock, and I can't talk long, but listen, I know you just, you avoid me. You stay away from me and stuff. Look, I heard you were sick. And uh, I know you just, I don't know, it's my Christian t-shirts freak you out and stuff. It's your impression of God. And no, man, listen, man. I said, no, no. And right then, it was so random, it, it sounded ridiculous. I said, oh, my goodness. I know why you got your hair like that and why it's purple. He got mad. He said, what? What about my hair? He thought I was going to be religious and hit him with a diagnosis. I said, Oh my goodness, you did that because it breaks the heart of your mother. He said, what? You know you're breaking your mother's heart wearing your hair like that because she beat you and bashed you with the Bible 
your whole childhood. And she said, the devil saw that. God saw that. Well, you just broke God's heart. Well, the devil's pleased now. And she hit you with language like that your whole life. And you resent her and you resent God because of it. He was non-functional. That sure beats getting mad at him. Sure beats judging him for his appearance. Sure beats paying him back and avoiding him. Well, if you don't know, yeah, I'll just stay away from you too. I don't need you either, pal. I said, listen, man, I need to pray with you. I don't think you need to leave today. Jesus is going to touch you. <sighs> okay. Laid hands right like this on him. I wanted to get him up high. I got him up high. I said, God freezes him in the aisle. Forklifts are blowing by. We need to get moving. People are coming. They're going to be blowing their horns. It's a high-paced, crazy place. Company was smart. They paid you incentive. They paid you for what you got done and put you on a team of eight so everybody kept each other moving or they'd kill you in the parking lot. <laughs> they were smart. <laughs> He's standing there like this. I'll never forget it as long as I live. He's just in the aisle. And I'm like, hey. I shook him, hey. He's like, and he looks at me and he goes, it was the funniest thing. He's got this purple mohawk. It's straight up and it's bright purple and he has no hair beside it. And he goes, neat. <laughs> neat. Neat. And he must have said neat like five times. And I'm chuckling and I'm like, yeah, God is so neat, man. Listen, you got to get on your equipment. we got to get out of here. I'll see you at lunch. We can talk. Neat, man. Yeah, neat. He never went home. We got to fellowship, talk, and his heart shifted. How cool is that? It's just workplace, guys. But watch this. To just want God to use you that way isn't the answer. To become one with his heart is the answer. Because then you'll always see the boy clear. Sometimes we pray these knock them off their high horse prayers because our hearts are a little offended. One of the reasons we have a hard time in marriage situations believing in seeing change. So if somebody's coming to your home group and it's sweet little Sally. She's the preciousest lady. She's the most precious lady in our whole church. And we're just tickled she comes to our home group, but she's got marriage issues. Because it just seems like the sweetest ladies have these ogre husbands sometimes. And then what happens is we get offended at that. And we think, how could that sweet little lady, how could he not see? And then the guys are resentful, thinking, man, if she was my wife, I'd take care of her and love her. That's what guys do. And they get envious and covet and jealous. And they think, he doesn't even know what he has. She's a gift. And he's just abusing her. And I don't even can't believe she stays with him. So then she comes to your little home group. And she's sitting there. And right before you leave home group, you're like, Sally? I mean, Sally is, you know what I mean? She's just the sweetest lady. She shines with the countenance of Jesus. She's tender. Like flowers aren't even in their season. She walks by and they just. <laughs> Sally, she's just Sally. She's amazing. And because she's so precious, you analyze that. And then you stop and you say at the end, you say, Sally, honey, before we leave, how's things at home? And Sally goes, And that's exactly what we do, though. In a bad way, we go, oh. And you start praying, for Lord, would you just come and comfort her? Lord, would you just bring her peace? It sounds so spiritual, and it feels like compassion. But nobody's realizing she's letting where her husband isn't decide where she is. And now she's just broken, and all you're saying is, oh, man, we know why you're broken, because if I had to live with that man, I'd be broken too, or I'd have done shot him by now. (laughs) And now you can't even pray for Sally because you're caught up in the sentiment of Sally. But it sounds spiritual, but nothing changes, because when you pray for the husband, it's because you're ticked off, and you pray all these David prayers, chop up his arm, break his ankle, (laughs) gouge out his eyes. And rarely does anybody in the home just slip to their knees and pray for Johnny who's so lost and take Sally by the cheeks and say, honey, look at me. I am so sorry that he doesn't understand. (laughs) No, no, look at me, Sally, honey. Listen, 
I understand it's been a challenge. He's not hitting you, right? He's not knocking you around. You don't feel in danger physically. No. It's just emotional. Okay, listen. You can't any longer allow where he's not to allow you to be where you are. Where he's not is not who you are. Who Jesus is, you're amazing, Sally. This is trying to rob you of everything you're called to. Productivity, watch. You're no less anointed, no less a daughter, no less a woman of God, no matter where Johnny's choosing to live. And all of a sudden she's... <laughs> I say, I've seen this a thousand times because it's the way I pastor. And I separate them from their right to be broken and pull them in to why they can be okay and actually have compassion on Johnny. To where they're not living personal and taking Johnny personal and letting one man decide their life when his name's not Jesus. It's Johnny. I never read where Johnny was Lord. So why does Johnny have the right to govern her life? Because he's husband? Well, who is Jesus? Is he greater? Do we seek ye first the... Do we love less our mother, father, spouse, children, houses, land, and yes, our own life? Well, then this is dead on. You got to turn a person's perspective in the midst of pain because what's causing pain is perspective. I remember walking in at night, middle of the night to an adultery situation because I'm a pastor and I got called and they were friends, and my wife said, you can go. And I said, she's the only one there, honey, and her kids are in bed. Are you okay? She said, honey, I am totally okay. My wife is the best. She knows me. You ought to see the notes she writes me. My wife knows me. She's not a YouTube fan. <laughs> she doesn't just see me preach. She's my wife. I keep this right here. This is just one. She writes them all the time. Hope you have the best weekend ever. You're a true man of God. I doubt God can find many men, if any, on this earth with your integrity, character, and heart. You want that from your wife because she lives with me. She gets loved by me in Jesus. And I'm not talking sexual. I'm talking conversations, I'm talking person, I'm talking personality, I'm talking disposition. I don't know how to raise my voice at her, I don't know how to put her down, it's not inside of me. I know how to be patient, I know how to be loving, I know how to be kind. And when she went through eight years of identity crisis, I wasn't weak and I didn't fall apart. And when she wouldn't come to church and I was a full-time pastor, it doesn't change truth. See? See? You might not know all the stories. You might just see me smile and figure, boy, he's got a special gift. Maybe I got a perspective that he gave me through his word. So maybe I'm not a hurting husband. Maybe I'm Christ in me. I learned this a long time ago. Truth doesn't know time. Eight years. A day is a thousand. A thousand is a day. So what's eight years? Hello? Hello? You say, eight years. Truth doesn't know time. Why do you let time dictate truth? Because self-centeredness is attached to your perspective. And you don't know how long you can take it and how long you can bear. And if they don't change by now, I'm about ready to fall apart. We need a breakthrough. Keep praying. I don't know how long I can do this. That's called just bearing along. That's not loving. That's not seeing clear. That's just raw enduring. Here's the cool thing. In those eight years, both my kids were running wild too, and it looked like you blew a bomb up in my family. I'm not insecure. It's not because I'm a bad daddy. It's because everybody needs their own revelation and has to have their own intimacy and walk out Jesus. So if you see me pumping gas on that day and you say, hey, Dan, how you doing? I'm not saying, man, you got to keep me in prayer. My wife won't even come to church. My kids are running wild, and I feel like I'm all alone. Dude, I don't know what I'm going to do if you don't pray. God, don't move. I don't even, I get those requests a lot, but I don't even know how to think that way. I'm okay. Why? Because he's Lord and I have a reason for being. You're not going to live that way without intimacy. You're not going to live that way because of willpower. You're going to live that way because of perspective through truth. 
In that season, that eight-year season, I got more phone calls than you could number from people that were married, crying over their marriage and their spouse, going through a tiny fraction of what I was in the middle of, and they were wiped out, falling apart, and ready to give up. A fraction. And I'd give them an answer, and they'd say, well, I can't expect you to understand. You're not in my shoes. And I wouldn't exploit my family, but I'd just minister truth. But they couldn't receive it because they believed I have it so good. That's why I'm full of joy. Joy comes from my salvation, not my wife. Jesus talked about marriage, and it wasn't this way from the beginning. And they said, why did Moses then give a certificate of divorce? He said, it's because of the hardness of your heart. Just get real. It wasn't this way from the beginning. We don't talk about this much. It gets a little funny in the room. I actually feel it already. Because so many of us have been through so much and we've made so many decisions. Some of us have been divorced, twice divorced, whatever. I'm just saying, listen, you can put all that away and under the blood, but let's keep getting understanding and let's be different people. And let's not repeat same things and live from same places if it doesn't produce life. I'm not so interested about where you've been. I'm interested about where you are and where you're going. It's the present and the future that I'm speaking into. You say, well, I feel nervous right now, Dan, because I, I filed for divorce and I got divorced. No, no, what I'm saying is you look at your motive, you look at your life, and you look at what would happen if you'd apply this to your life. Would you live the same? And if you say no, then go after the truth and become something different. Or you're going to hold on to your story, hold on to your decisions, protect yourself through your analogies, and you're going to be in self-defense and not even realize it your whole life because you feel marked by this and the way people see you and how they, and you're always in this uncomfortable place. Are you with me? I hope you're okay. Intimacy with God. Get alone with Him. Let's look at something. I wanted to turn you to Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to just stop all that I was doing right there. I want to go to some scripture. I'll just look. I don't have a ton of time. God, you're good. I dropped those little things about my family on you just so you can relate. So sometimes you have to tell people where you've been just enough so they understand you're not just popping off and sharing theology. Like, have you seen passion in me this week? A little bit? I, I can't help it because it's not my theology. It's a revelation. It's my life. There's nothing I preach to you that I haven't walked through and don't walk in daily. It's my life. It's not my doctrine. That's why I preach it with all my heart. That's why I'm so excited and passionate. That's why I get silly. That's why I go, yay. All the stuff I must do. People come up to me and they go, Arr. and I say, what do I do that a lot? They say, you do that a lot. I'm like, okay. Because I'm not thinking about it. It's not a gimmick. It's not a preaching style. That would be weird. <laughs> I always, I feel like I have to rooster crow when I get excited. I, I, I've, I've rooster crowed when I'm preaching already. Pastor friend of mine just sent me a little emoji rooster thing on my phone. He said, he said uh, I know power and love's going well. You were probably feeling like this or something. He sent me a little rooster crow thing. Because <laughs> I was in his church and I... And I did a little banny strut, and I was strutting around. <laughs> Bannies are bad dudes, man. They're just this big, but they'll take on the world. She'd be banny Christians. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. I want you to see this. Guys, I, I'm talking soft and gentle right now, but I can't be passionate enough about how important it is that you and I see this truth Stay in this truth and don't let anything take us from this truth because it's the doorway to intimacy. If you don't see yourself the way God sees you, you will not have the confidence to be with him intimately. Here's another thought that just hit me hard. If you don't see God simply for who he is through his son, and you don't have a clear view of God, you won't be inspired to be with him either. The two things that keep people from being with God, a wrong view of him or a wrong view of themselves. It's the, it's the two things. 
a wrong view of him, a wrong view of themselves. It's hard to tell this story about my granddaughter because people hear it for where they're not, and we're just geared in an ear to hear, and, oh boy, well, that's not me, and grandpa will say, well, that with me, or our grandchild will say, well, that ain't my granddad. And, 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 and we compare ourselves among ourselves instead of say, wow, there's a bar, I'm going for it, that's possible, let's put this under the blood and let's go after this. I have an amazing relationship with my granddaughter and I hadn't understood it for a long time. I didn't understand it. I, I said, Lord, I've never met anybody like this child because I'd hear stories of her at home and it didn't even sound like her. And then my daughter would say, she's not always the girl you think and stuff and say it in front of her. And she'd kind of do like this, but around me. My granddaughter's 12. This is not an overstatement. I'm not embellishing this. She's 12. She has never put me in the position from little up, as long as I can remember. It's, this is going to sound unreachable. It, it wipes me out, but the revelation is what wrecks me. She has never put me in the position to be stern with her. If grandpa says, no, honey, I don't think that's wise right now or the time, she says, okay. I've never one time had my granddaughter go, no, but no, but grandpa, I would expect her to. But she's never done it and never even came close. People used to say, but well, you probably got her so spoiled, I don't even know what you mean. I, I just love her. But here's what she's never gotten from me. She's never got stern from me. She's never got one expression of disappointment. She's never got one negative tone out of her grandpa from the time she was born. Not one. So guess what the Lord showed me? See, because she was nine. This is when I learned this. She was nine, and I said, Lord, what is it about this girl? Because I remember when my daughter was in labor, I went into prayer, and it was probably in the top three spiritual experiences I've had in my life, praying for my granddaughter. And... Uh, and everything I remember prophetically coming out of my mouth by the Lord, I see in her life. It's pretty fascinating. She's nine years old. We drive eight and a half hours one way in a car, spend two nights in a hotel, and drive eight and a half hours back in a car. So she's 17 hours in a car and two in a hotel nights. Not one remote complaint out of a nine-year-old. Well, I've never heard, seen anything like it even close to my whole life. I would expect her to say, are we ever going to get there? Are we soon there? She's sitting Indian style with her belt on, looking at me, talking, laughing. We're being silly about things. We were doing a thing about the cows and because we're driving through Virginia on 81 and it's just pastures and cows for five hours. And I'm like, oh my goodness, look at all the cows. And, and then she'd be like, oh wow, cows, Grandpa. And then we'd be sitting and she'd say, Grandpa, look, green pastures everywhere. We were just, because they were everywhere. We were acting like it was the first one we saw. She's sitting Indian style, giggling, talking, and we're talking the whole time. She looks at the clock and she goes, Grandpa, we're already driving four and a half hours. It doesn't even seem like an hour. We're over halfway there, Grandpa. And I mean, she's just that precious. Not a remote complaint, 17 hours and two nights in a hotel. I get home and I said, Lord, I'm laying on my bed and I was actually weeping because of my experience with her. And I'm like, what is it about her? Like, how do you do that? Is it special gift, grace, what? He said, no, Dan. He said, it's the way she sees you, values you, and respects you. She's got not one negative impression from you to her. She values who she sees you to be so highly, it brings the best out in her. Because she honors you. It's the importance of men seeing me for who I am. And it's why my name has been so profaned. How many people, well, God, well, if God, well, God shouldn't know. Well, I'm just first. Well, how do I know it's even the Bible? Well, God just seems, I don't know, he killed a lot of people in the Old Testament. I don't know. I just feel like, well, God, 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 God. 
I'm not over-exaggerating, even though I'm dramatic. He said, it's the way she sees you. I'm not saying her mommy's a bad mommy. But I am saying there's times where there's raised voice. And would you knock it off? You, need it. Well, you wouldn't even do that if you were around your grandpa. You only do that to me. And something gets etched away every time because the motive has nothing to do with love. And innocence gets chipped away. And all of a sudden you're just getting corrected because you're wrong. Not because you're more than that. All of a sudden you believe you have the ability to get on people's nerves. All of a sudden you actually start introvert, in, in, inadvertently believing people only like you when you're doing right. And all these little messages get sent as we're growing up. And it's through our parenting and it's through our lives together. You might find this hard to believe. You know where I got the revelation to never do that to my granddaughter? You say, Jesus, nope, my grandpa. I did his funeral when I was 48 years old. Granddad was four months shy of 100 years old. My 93-year-old grandmother was sitting there at the funeral, and I started boasting on granddad. I used to say that I had a storybook grandparents. They were nursery rhyme storybook grandparents. My grandpa was a Christian man, but he wasn't like us, Todd. He, wasn't, he didn't have the revelation. He wasn't super expressive, but man, was he a Christian man. He never spent a day waking up without kneeling by his bed. He never wanted to touch his grandkids in the flesh. He wanted to touch them in love. I have six cousins. I'm the seven. There's seven cousins. He had seven grandchildren. When I shared at his funeral that I have not one memory of disgust, frustration, raised voice, or tension from granddad to me in 48 years, my six cousins lose it and cry uncontrollably because it was all their testimony. And none of them really thought about it deeply. We just kind of took it for granted that grandpa was a special, nice man. But all of a sudden it hit us that even in our moments of giving him opportunity, my oldest cousin came to me. She was always called the black sheep. She was in girls' homes by age 13, pregnant by 15, 16. Drugs, mess. She was always the black sheep. She came running up to me and cried. And she said, I have the same testimony from Grandpa. And everybody called me the black sheep. And he's only ever been gentle to me and loved me and kind. He's never treated me for what I did, ever. And she's bawling. And she said, now I realize why I wouldn't smoke around him because I didn't want to hurt his heart because I knew he loved me. I realize why I wouldn't swear around him because I knew it would hurt his heart to see me that way. And I just respected him so much that it brought the best out in me when I was around him. That was my cousin crying at the funeral. So I said in my heart, if I had that with my grandpa, then it is possible. I'm going to have that with my grandkids. And I'm going to let that legacy get passed on. So it's well and alive, that legacy right now at age 12. Now I'm stirring. I'm stirring my daughter for more kids. It's just not working well. My son got married a year ago, and I'm going to start asking my daughter-in-law every time they come in until she's just so fed up with me that she gets pregnant. I'm just going to be like, are you pregnant? Hey, take her chin. You're glowing. Are you pregnant? I'm just going to, every time until she just gets pregnant. They got twins strong running their family. I'm like, good. Give us two or three. My wife and I will each have something to hold. It'll be awesome. My daughter, she's like, I'm like, she doesn't want no more babies. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Read your Bible. <laughs> You're supposed to be an olive plant at the table, and around the chairs is all your little olives. You got one chair filled, girl. I, I see at least six chairs around your table. Like, what are you doing? Read your Bible. I took her out to eat, and, her, and, and my son-in-law, and, and she said, Dad, did you just bring us out to eat to talk me into having children? I said, no, to command you to have children. I am your dad. 
I said, I realize you're 30 years old and you've never listened to much that I've said, but if you would listen to this, you'll do well. <laughs> I'm just messing with her. She's so, she was so like done with it. She's like, Dad, just drop it. Just stop. I said, nope, I'm not stopping. I said to my son-in-law, listen, buddy, do you want children? She said, Dad. I said, no, no, he's your husband. Let him talk. <laughs> you want children? He said, actually, I do want more. I said, oh. I said, man, where's your voice, your authority, and your wisdom in this marriage, boy? <laughs> I said, she's sitting there like. <laughs> so I go like this. I go, so how many do you really want? Be honest. She said, he said, I would love to have two more. I said, dude, where's your wisdom? She's sitting right there. I'm just playing with him. I said, tell her you want four. Meet in the middle. <laughs> she said, Dad, just stop. Just stop. I got an amen out of my son-in-law. I said, and, and guys, I'm going to drop it now. She said, good. I said, I don't see a better night than tonight to get this thing rolling. And he said, amen, brother. And she went, mm. <laughs> So I need grandchildren to love. So, so what I do is I just love on everybody else's kids. And <laughs> yeah, I got to stop here. Let's look at verse 21. Man, I do. I want grandkids bad. I, three weeks ago, my wife said, my wife said, she said, I don't think the kids are going to have any babies. She means my son and his new wife of a year. And I said, what do you mean? They said they're going to have kids. I think they're too in love. They're too enjoying each other. They're just so buddies. And they're, she's 30, he's 28. And I just, I think another two years is going to go by. They're just having so much fun together and it's beautiful to watch. I just, I'm not going to have my heart set on them having kids. I just honestly don't see them having kids. I was going to say, get thee behind me, Kim. But I didn't. I didn't. I'm like, I said, really? I said, uh, you don't think they're going to have I said, I think they're going to have She said, no, I don't think so. I said, well, then you know what? She said, what? I said, I'm going to start calling you Sarah. She said, oh, stop. I said, come on, Sarah. So, you know, a couple times in a row I called her Sarah, so I'm trying to change her confession that my kids will have kids. <laughs> I think it would be easier to believe that than Sarah. <laughs> Amen. I'm just having fun with y'all. I figured I could have fun and we can laugh a little since I've been like slicing your hearts in pieces for two days. <laughs> Isn't it good to get cut by the Lord though? And then it's like Todd said, you're like, ah, and you're, oh. <laughs> I call it Holy Ghost anesthesia. See, the reason you're laughing right now, you should be nervous because the knife's coming. Like when he gets us this silly, it's because what he's about to say is so sharp, he doesn't want you to bleed and hurt. <laughs> no, just, I'm kidding. <laughs> Actually, I'm not kidding. But <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you look over and you say, are you bleeding? <laughs> look at verse 21. Of Colossians 1, and we'll close with this. I'm done with this. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah, this is my last session with you guys, too. Uh, no, it is. But uh, thank you for your hungry and humble hearts and letting me talk so plain. I would anyway. I would. <laughs> because it's all I know. But thank you for receiving it. I sat through session after session. I sat through Todd's sessions. Honestly, I'll be honest with you guys. Can I be real frank and honest? I could tell when I first got up, some of you were a little taken back by the message. Just a little bit like, whoa, what? And, and, the, and the second session, I thought it was a deliverance meeting. I had 20 different expressions at one time out there. I could see them, and I was like just looking up. But I, I, I saw it sinking in. I saw it making sense, and I saw it becoming simple. And it just, we just see, these are like identity crash courses, like, we want you to get a word of knowledge and see the sick healed, but man, we want you to wake up and have an unveiled face and be in fellowship with God. Because if you wake up and have an unveiled face and fellowship with God, you're going to see things in your life. Yeah? So that's our goal. So we kind of trick you in, power and love, but it's actually love and power. <laughs> Just power and love sounds like a better flow, but... 
Love and power, it's like doing to be or being to do. You be to do, you don't do to be. Just don't ever get it backwards. You live out of your being, and all you're doing flows out of who you've become. You don't do to qualify, you're qualified through Him. You become through Him. You be forgiven, you be loved, you be accepted, you be free, you be fulfilled. To be empowered to do what those things do. Here's how it works, right here. This thing right here, I'll wrap up with this. And if you do this in faith, you hold on to this truth, you'll, you'll do well. Are you with me? And you, he's talking to you, not me, you, no. He's, and you, he's talking to all of us, isn't he? And you, you can't get around this. And you, who once were alienated, separated, estranged in another world, alienated. You were on another page, so was I. You were alienated, and not only alienated, you were enemies to everything God stands for. Why? Because he's love and we were selfish. You get it? It says, if you love the world and the things in the world in 1 John, the love of the Father is not in you. And And the things in the world are the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. You love the world and the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in you. That's the word. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. What he's saying is if you invite me in and get intimate with me, who I am will so transform you, you'll see different and those things won't be your reality. He's saying he himself will change us if we yield to him. Yeah. <laughs> Not one day in 23 years did I wake up, okay, got to be a Christian, got to be a Christian. Man, I got to do good today. I don't even know what that means. Stop all that. Okay, I can't sin today. I can't sin. I don't even think about sin. I think about righteousness and Jesus and him loving me. I think about Holy Spirit living inside of me. I think about how life is a gift. I'm not waiting to fail. I'm manifesting to be a son. I'm becoming. Yeah? Come on. Good-hearted people wake up and try not to sin, stay sin conscious. They always take their own tests and grade their own scores, and they always end up failing. If you realize Jesus took the test, gave you a passing grade, you've got a diploma, flip the little thing and move on in Jesus, grace will begin to empower your life to live everything your heart desires. Starts right here. And you and me, having once been alienated and enemies by our minds and the way they were working, see? We were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. So if God can renew my mind and change my mind and change my perspective, he can narrow my eye and bring forth life. So our motivation and the way our minds work, the motive of our heart, the why behind our life, alienated us, put us on another page than God in the left field and made us enemies to everything he stands for. So wouldn't you say that Christianity is a whole lot more than praying a prayer to go to heaven, but it's giving your life and getting your mind renewed and being renewed in the spirit of your mind? Yeah, not conformed to the world, but transformed by renewing your mind. It means thinking like you never thought before so you can prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. What's it mean? So you get on page with God and start seeing what he sees. Ain't that awesome? This thing is a far cry from just bless me, Lord, provide for me, and protect me. That's called discouraged Christianity when life's not going well. Confused, quandary, I thought he loved me while I prayed. What did I do wrong? (sighs) See, when you're doing that, the enemy says, wow, they don't have an identity. They don't even know why he's in them. They're an easy target. Boom, bam, pop. Yeah? Yeah? And you resist the enemy standing steadfast in the faith, a perspective we all live by. It's what makes us one, people. You come from a different background. You like it fast. I like it slow, loud, soft, whatever. There's so much diversity in this room, you couldn't even lay it all out. Some of you are called to things that other people don't even have in their heart. They're called to other things. That doesn't make us different. That's just a diversity. But through diversity, we actually find true unity. Why? Because whether I drive home to PA and you drive to wherever, when we wake up tomorrow, we both wake up for the same reason. That makes us one. 
we wake up to love, we wake up to pursue his image, that's the unity of faith. It's not, yeah, but I go to this church, yeah, but I was raised in this circle, but I, we would all agree in the beauty and power of love, and we're created for his image, and he said, follow me. I think we can all agree that there's a grace that can change our lives, empower our lives to live in a different place than we've ever lived. That's what makes us one. We can all wake up for his image. We can all wake up to love. Tomorrow is Sunday. Churches all over the nation are going to have services. You could fill every single seat in every church across the land, and it won't change the world. But if you become love, it has to. So going to church is in Christianity. Christ-likeness is. So why do we assemble ourselves together? To stay focused, sharp, and stirred up in love and good works. Hebrews 10. I'm trying to close here, and I'm not doing good. I keep little pointers. <sighs> it's my last time with you. See, now I'm getting sentimental. I'm trying to drag it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we were all alienated. We were all enemies by the way our minds worked. Yet now he has reconciled us. Doesn't say we changed our mind. Says he's, he reconciled us. That means he saw us for more than we were thinking and producing. Do you realize on your darkest day, he didn't lose sight of your creative value and who you're created to be? On your most willful adventure, he didn't change his mind about you. He said, I know you from the beginning and I know why you're here. You just don't know. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. Now watch this. Yet now he's reconciled. Watch. In the body of his flesh through death. So how did he reconcile us? Through the cross, through the death of Jesus Christ. He put all that we were on him. Why did he do that? Here it is after the comma. To present you, uh-oh, present you, pull off the tarp, ta-da, unveiled, present you. Look, look what he did. <laughs> Holy, ah, <laughs> blameless, man, and above reproach in his sight. So truly, according to the word, guess what the blood accomplished? Took sin away, Lamb of God, take away the sin of the world. Well, if he takes away the sin of the world, then what? I guess we ought to be sons. If he cleanses the fallen righteousness, I guess we ought to be righteous. I guess we ought to start where he finished. And if he took all this away to present us holy, blameless, and above reproach, that's our starting point. That's how you go to bed. That's how you wake up. That's where you camp in faith, and that's where grace meets you and produces these things in your life. Without you trying to do those things, you become those things because of the blood, because the blood is speaking better things than the blood of Abel. Are you with me? Now watch. Now, here's where you come in. Verse 23. So did you just see through the word that through his body you're presented holy, blameless, and above reproach on God's side? That's how he sees you, period. Now watch. Here's where you come into play. Just living by faith. Verse 23. If indeed, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, watch, and are not moved away from the hope of this gospel in which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Here's what he's saying. Guys, through the body of his flesh, through death, he washed that thing away and made you holy, blameless, and above reproach if you continue believing it and don't let anything change your mind. That's where you come in. That's the faith established. So condemnation, guilt, condemnation, shame, never the Lord. I did not come to con. So why do we go there? Why do we receive it? Why do we say, well, I'm just so condemned when his goal is not condemnation? Condemnation, guilt, condemnation, and shame. Anti finished works. They're never in the tool belt of God. He doesn't use them ever. Guilt, guilt is you saying, I'm not forgiven. Condemnation is you saying, I'm worthy to be judged. Shame is you saying, what I'm ashamed of is still who I am. That's why I'm ashamed. I just read holy, blameless, above reproach. You start there. You stay there. Don't get moved away. Don't even let a slip pull you away. You run right back 
and say, Father, I thank you that is not who you created me to be in God. Those things aren't in my heart. And I realize I just, in God, I'm just separating right now. And I thank you. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the blood. Thank you that I'm clean. Thank you, God, holy and blameless. You say you'd respond that way if you slipped. How would you respond? Lose your identity for three weeks, three days, three months, three weeks? What? Call four friends, cry, go over it ten times? No, no, no. You run to him. The days of naked and ashamed are over. You've been fully clothed. Amen? Okay, I'm done. Uh, I'm not. I'm just stopping because of time. I'm never done. I just stop. <laughs> but I'm done. Let me, yeah. No, it's all good. It's just Jesus. Let me pray over you guys. Stop. Stand up, everybody. We're going to pray. <laughs> yeah, it's the word. It's good. The word's good. It brings life. You guys blessed me last night, man. We talked about it back there, how I was preaching a couple different times, and everybody just went, ah, and just jumped up. Ah, and I was like, oh, man. And you know what it is? It's our hearts embracing truth. It's, our, it's clicking. It's like, yeah, this is doable, man. This is this is reachable. This is simple. This is this isn't deep. This isn't complex. But man, it's profound. It'll change me. Yeah, I can live this. I can believe this. That's what I felt happening last night. I felt like God just session after session was just sowing into the ground of our heart. And all of a sudden we're like, yeah, I see it. So I'm gonna pray a simple prayer. I'm gonna pray a simple prayer, but but sincere. Father, let us continue to see what we see. You came to open the eyes of the blind, to give us sight. Satan blinds the eyes of those who don't believe. You found believers. And I thank you their eyes are open and they will always see this truth. And if in any way they live outside this truth, you yourself, Holy Spirit, bring them right on course. And let this conviction remain all the days of their life and let them run well because of who you are in their lives and let them stay right where you finished. I bless them and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, love you. If you enjoyed this message, please visit danmolerarchive.com to find over 2,500 more messages from Dan, all organized by category, playlist, and search. Enjoy.